In this episode of MPTV, we sit down with Brooks of Hearth and Hill in Park City, Utah. When I first came across this brand, it looked big. I thought it was a franchise, multi-location. Turns out it's a one-location restaurant with big plans in the future. You can tell the touch him and his father put on it to make it look like more than it was right now, more like what it will be in the future. We're gonna talk about how they treat their employees and they've cultivated an awesome team to help take this brand and do things that other people in this community are doing, which is focus on the locals. We're also gonna dig into some of the marketing efforts he's done leveraging social media help from high school students. Let's go check it out. Hey, what's up? It's Matt. We're back with another episode of MPTV. We're in Park City, Utah, and we're here with Brooks of Hearth and Hill. Brooks, welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be a part of it. Thanks for stopping by. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about your background, and then we'll get into the concept. Yeah, I grew up in Los Angeles in a city called La Cunada. Um, I loved restaurants since I was a little kid. Uh, one of the first Christmas presents I remember asking for was a cash register, so I could play a pretend restaurant with my two sisters, who sadly were... <laughs> subjected to it for many years. And uh, from there, I got my first restaurant job in La Cunada when I was 15 years old. Worked at a uh, mom and pop cafe that I worked with, uh, worked at on and off for six years. And then uh, from there, I went to hotel restaurant tours and management school at the University of Denver in Colorado. And um, after that, graduated and went and opened the uh, five-star hotel Montage in Beverly Hills. And was grateful to be about a part of that project. And the timing was Perfect, I guess, if you will say that it was right in 2008 when the um, market was crashing and obviously the hospitality industry, just like many, faced a lot of challenges. And so I was thrown into situations I probably never would have been otherwise. Uh, people above me were let go and here was this kid fresh out of college getting paid peanuts. So obviously I wasn't going anywhere because that was one of their cheapest laborers <laughs> around. Uh, and so it was an amazing learning opportunity and, and grew up coming out here to Park City skiing. And so when Montage uh, was building their property out here in Deer Valley, I was intrigued, came out and visited, and then when it was time to apply to transfer out, I did. And I uh, moved out here in, 2000, in the fall of 2010 to open their property here in Montage Deer Valley. Um, and I worked in their food and beverage outlets there for about two and a half years. And then one of the um, former colleagues there that I worked with uh, went and worked for Sundance Resort, Robert Redford's yep. uh, resort. And uh, he had one uh, outlet outside of the resort here in Park City on Main Street. And I went and became the general manager of that restaurant for two and a half years. And, uh, we were able to turn around from a $2.3 million to a $4 million restaurant, and um, it was a lot of fun, built a team that uh, was amazing. And then from there, my wife got an opportunity to go uh, work at the Montage Hotel in Maui. And so I moved there with her, and I worked for a restaurant group called Merriman's. Um, also has a monkey pod in the Moku uh, throughout the islands of Hawaii, and learned a ton there. Obviously, the culture is much different than here, and uh, really the, the sense of hospitality there is something that I've never experienced anywhere else. Um, it's just so strong in the sense of welcome and, and wanting to take care of you. And then from there, my dad retired and uh, he uh, was spending a lot more time out here in Park City. And so I, he started looking at different restaurants that were for sale. And I thought to myself, well, what are we doing in Hawaii when my dad is living out my dream and in, in back in Park City? And we, we liked Hawaii, my wife and I, but it wasn't a long-term plan for us. And so uh, we moved back here. And long story short, we found this location that we're in right now and we loved it um, because we wanted to be a local centric restaurant that was a gathering place. And you know, we are in a uh, tourist driven town, but we wanted to focus on the locals and really um, drive the business with them first and then have the word of mouth spread to the visitors and the tourists that came here for ski vacations or summer trips or whatever it might be. And, um, and it's worked out really well for us and the area around us has Really, uh, we've seen more businesses open and it's really becoming the place to go to. Um, there's free parking around here. It's easy to get to. It's only 25 minutes from Salt Lake City, um, 10, 15 minutes from Main Street. So it's really, we're able to get the best of both worlds. Um, we're able to attract great associates here to work here and um, it's been a lot of fun. And it had to be a, a, a cheating, a cheat sheet for your dad, the fact that getting in the restaurant business with your experience, going from the beginning to these different places and, and seeing what you saw. Exactly. Yeah. No, I've, I mean, I love this industry so much. I wake up every day and to me, it's not a job. It's just, it's fun to get in here and love working with our team members. And my dad uh, was in the financial industry. And so we're able to complement each other really well. And especially during the pandemic, 
Um, with all the grant applications and all that, he's able to really be a strength on that side. And I can help focus with the team on trying to drive the business on a daily basis and take care of the guests that are here and curbside and all the other things that are, are now a standard. I think some of the people watching or listening might be jealous. LA, Colorado, Park City, Hawaii. Some people are stuck in Kentucky and Tennessee yes. like me. Yes, I know. I think I got my wife a shirt at one point maybe in Hawaii that said, I live where you vacation. Um, and certainly that has not been lost on me. Very grateful for that um, and for the experiences and the opportunities to live in places that are so amazing. And here in Park City, so much to offer. Um, you know, we have a brand new airport down in Salt Lake yeah. City that you probably just landed yeah, in. It's amazing. Um, and so we're very lucky to have that and uh, live in a city, uh, in a town, in an area that's booming. Um, you know, there's a whole new Silicon Slopes area down in the Salt Lake area that's just booming right now. Uh, many have projected that Salt Lake will be one of the fastest, if not the fastest, to rebound from the pandemic over most big cities in the country. Um, just talked to the head of the convention down in Salt Lake last week, um, and she said that they're anticipating that they will rebound quicker than most convention cities in the country, if not be one of the quickest to rebound. Um, they already have groups that are booking for later this summer. Um, optimistic that things will be able to be in a place that they can operate successfully and safely and healthily. Uh, so, no, it's we love being around here, and there's so much to do here. You know, the phrase goes, come for the winter, stay for the summer. Um, you know, obviously there's the skiing in the winter, the snowshoeing, um, the sledding, uh, the snowmobiling, but in the summer there's concerts outside. You have the horseback riding, the whitewater rafting, the mountain biking, the hiking. Um, just so much fun stuff to do and never a boring time. So if you're looking to move somewhere, Park <laughs> City is certainly a fun place. It's a great place to be. Yeah. What have you seen, because you've been in a lot of places, I don't know about the Hawaii where you were with regards to tourism, but you came here and you know, it's easy to get sucked into Main Street, I would imagine, but there's also those where they call them the shoulders, I think as I've heard them uh -huh. called, where the people aren't here in those two or three months in the ski season, yeah. early ski season, and they don't really have that local traffic. Where you're at, I mean, we're a couple minutes from where we're staying, right near the mountains, Yeah. and you're also right in the heart of where people actually who live here are at. What, what was the big, uh, what, was there something that you saw in your travels to Hawaii and Denver and LA that kind of got you to where think, okay, I need to be that local guy? Yeah, I mean, I think, I know whenever I travel with my wife, we always would seek out where do the locals go? Okay. Um, you know, I didn't know this one time when I went to Mexico and they're like, I don't think you want to go where the locals go. <laughs> uh, but no, I think people crave those places. You know, where are the places that are authentic, that are genuine and do the right thing um, give back to the community, partner with nonprofits, um, support their associates the right way, um, and that aren't just those places that overcharge the, the local, you know, the visitors that come to town and try to make a buck during the high season or whatever it might be. Um, you know, we're someone that stays consistent year round. Um, we'll never just raise our prices in the winter because we know that there's visitors here. Um, our goal is to have our clientele be 70% locals year round, and we've stayed true to that. And I think that the locals trust us. And I think that's a big word that oftentimes isn't used in the restaurant industry um, because I think sometimes restaurants are too quick to make a quick buck. And our plan from day one has been, we're in this for the long term. We wanna be here for many, many years to come. Uh, we wanna have associates that are here for many years to come. Um, and that takes investment, that takes time, takes emotional um, energy and, and all the things that come with it that aren't easy. Um, but over time, you'll build the clientele and the, the staff that want to be here and want to stay. And so that's what we've kind of built from the day one and, and doing the right thing. And going back to something you said earlier, because this just got me, my attention. Uh, I've, I've interviewed CEOs of franchise brands and different companies, and they'll go into a, a location. They'll take over locations, the franchise you on a business. They'll keep it running it. But they'll make certain changes, and the business doubles. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Robert Redford's restaurant you were involved with that you took it from a couple million and up. What, what did you, when you went in there, how did you attack that? Because like, we have a lot of people that watch our podcast that listen that are doing that situation and you go into something and you don't want to upset the apple cart, but you want to yeah. make changes that make it better and grow it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's true, you know, in interviews you ask a lot of times the chefs, you know, like, okay, what's your plan of attack going to be when you take over the job of a restaurant that's been around for 15 years? Um, and I love the ones that say, I'm going to come in and I'm going to watch and I'm going to just do the, you know, obviously assist the team and, and make sure the day to day runs, but I'm just going to watch and identify the areas that are strong. Um, cause oftentimes there are, there are some areas that are going really well, 
then also obviously identify the areas that need to be improved upon. And so that was kind of my game plan when I took over. It was a weird time. I took over in the middle of the winter, okay. which in a winter town is not the most ideal to leave your job in the winter town and then go over to another, but it was the opportunity and it came about. Um, and so it gave me two months in the winter to really just see what was going on. And then like you said, there are some downtimes here in the mountains, which are becoming less and less and smaller and smaller. And so those downtimes gave me the opportunity to really identify the team. I think that that's where it all starts. And so there are certainly people on the team that just weren't the right fit. Yeah. They were working one day a week, two days a week, which just doesn't work in a restaurant, um, or just weren't bringing the right attitude. And so we let some of those go, both from an hourly so standpoint, but also management wise. Um, and then the one thing I realized that was really lacking there was group business. Um, it was a restaurant that kind of had three different rooms, including one up in the upstairs that was perfect for private dining. And so they were you know, booking a private dining group at 6.30, where you couldn't book a group before, you couldn't book a group after, so you were losing money. Yeah. And so we restructured the way that we did that. We put new F and food and beverage minimums in place. Um, and then I just went out and started knocking on doors and connecting with sales professionals at the local hotels that had groups that were like, hey, we want a dinner for 40, and they would say, hey, Brooks, we've connected with you, we want a book. And so it was building that trust. Um, and I think one thing that I always try to tell a lot of people is just call back. When people inquire about a large you know, party or whatever it might be, is a lot of these meeting planners or party planners, or whatever, they just want to check it off the list. And so if you can be the first one that calls them back and says, yes, we would love to have your group, here's the information, this is the menu, boom, boom, boom. They just want you to make it as easy as possible for them so that they can be done with it, give you the credit card and say, great, we'll see you in two months. Um, and not have to continually call you, pester you, email you, you know, is this going to happen? Is this, you know, are we going to show up and is, are we even going to have a reservation? Whatever it might be. And so that was kind of our mentality at, at Zoom was let's make it as easy as possible for people to book groups. And the more we do that and the more that we make it easy for the meeting planners in Park City to trust us, that they can tell their client, yeah, go to Zoom, you're gonna have a great experience and you're not gonna be calling me the next day being like, that was a disaster, why do you send people there? Um, so I think that was really the key. And to be honest, and I love our team here at Hearth and Hill, but probably the best team I've ever worked with was at Zoom. We just built a team that really loved each other, had strong chemistry, um, would back each other up, would do any, you know, would literally do anything for each other. And so I think that was the key as well, is just finding the right people. Um, I remember a boss told me once, you know, who do you want on the limo with you? Um, and so we found the right people to come to the limo and that you know, you'd want to go have lunch with. Yeah, we had a similar experience. We had a coach come in for a, we had a boat in our V dealership that crashed during the 08 economic crisis. So I know it all well. I can relate to a lot of restaurant owners in 2020 with COVID. So I know what it's like to go from a million four in sales July of 07 to 48 grand July of 08 in one month. Uh, but in that time before that, we had a consultant come in and same thing, he, he called it the bus. He said, you wanna see who's on the bus? Yeah. And then who you're gonna run over with the bus. Yeah. And, was, and he was like, sure. honestly, there's people on your team that don't wanna be here, don't care about being here. They're here because it's a check. They're here for the wrong reasons. And yep. that hurts the people that are on your team for the right reasons. Like you mentioned, yeah. those short-term employees that are working one or two days a week. If they're not there five days a week, they can't build that cohesiveness. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I just told our team this morning in pre-service, I said, you know, we all represent Hearth and Hill at the end of the day, whether you like it or not. Um, when a guest, you know, has a bad experience, they're not going to say, well, Joey caused me to have a bad experience. They're going to say, I had a bad experience at Hearth and Hill, which is all of us. Yep. And so the weak link can really challenge the restaurant and, and cause many people not to come back. Um, and so I think the challenge that restaurateurs always face is how do you get your associates to look at the big picture? and to understand that it's more than just that one experience and making the tips from that one guest. And that's what we were telling our team this morning is like, if we just focus on the now, then we're not gonna have guests for the later. And uh, you know, we wanna look at the big picture and, and guests coming back you know, in two months, three months, four months, five months, um, cause that's how we're all gonna make money in the long term. Um, but if we're just focused on the money now, then we're gonna lose guests. And so I've always said throughout my career is let's focus on the service, let's focus on what we can control, not what we can't control and everything else will work itself out. You will make more money in the long term. I know it's hard to really believe that, but I found that it's true. Yeah. Um, and, and guests want to come back and see the servers that they're connecting with and that are authentic. Yeah. Know the menu, you know, know what Hearth and Hill is all about, represent it well, you know, smile, are positive, you know, aren't, aren't complaining about something that happened the day before to some guest or whatever it might be. 
it rubs them the wrong way. Well, and that's, if you've heard the term leading indicators, lagging indicators when it comes to planning and goal setting, and that's, to me, one of those things that a lot of people sometimes say, hey, I want to have a restaurant that's $5 million a year in five years. Okay, well, that's great. Yeah. You know, what are the lagging indicators? That's a lagging indicator. What are the leading indicators to get you there? Yeah. What are the little things that you have to do every day, like take care of guests, reply to positive and negative reviews, you know, treat people right. Yeah. Like I think a lot of times in business, people want that quick fix. We're accustomed in the U.S. here to, you know, we got diet fads and pills yeah. that we lose 100 pounds tomorrow. Yeah. Nobody wants to put in the work and eat right for two years and exercise. Yeah. And business is no different. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we really strive to do the right thing every day, which is not always, most times it's not the, the easiest thing to do. It takes more time, more effort, you know, more spreadsheets or whatever it might be, more training. Um, but in the long term, it's going to help the business succeed even more. Okay, break time. Restaurant owners, you're watching MPTV, so you're obviously interested in increasing your sales and profits. But what if I told you you could eliminate the hope and pray out of your marketing? You could spend money and actually see results. You know, most marketing starts with attention, like a billboard. The problem is that attention leads nowhere. That's why we created the ROI Engine Restaurant Program. We take attention and gain huge engagement, whether it's in-store or online. We help you build a database with deep customer information that's comprised of email, cell phone, and birthday. And then we drive them into the restaurant with trackable results. Yes, results you can actually see. If you're interested and want to have a conversation, check out restaurantmarketingthatworks.com. Worst case scenario, you get a lot of great ideas. Now back to the show. Now you, you said something about that I crack up that it's a thought process that has to happen, but nobody does it, which was follow up. Yeah. So we've, we've got a client of ours who work with him, uh, Stephen, uh, it's Apple Spice, it's a company out of South Carolina. It's a catering company. Like they're, they have, it's a restaurant, but you can't go eat there. You pick it up or it's mostly group sales. And I, would, I remember asking him what his keys to success were and we were helping him get leads for that part of the business. And he said, the key to success is my team calls those leads back in 15 minutes. Is if that comes in via email or text, that somebody calls them back right away. He said, because we find in our business that the biggest complaint we hear from people that are buying food for 30 pharmaceutical reps, that they called 10 places. Yeah. And it's like yeah. two days later, and I'm like, how hard is it? Like, that's, the, that's how you grow this part of the business. Absolutely. I mean, I've heard that some of the, the biggest restaurants in Park City here it's taken them weeks to call back clients about private events um, and it blows my mind yeah. um, but we're happy to be the ones that call back right away and and get that client booked and, and happy and um, yeah it sometimes it it's just the easy you know you just gotta do the things that basics. are the basics yeah exactly and I remember when we were in the boat business you know, this is early we started it in 1999 on the internet and so we were a very early adopter with the internet and email marketing and we had a rule that if a lead came in before 9 p.m. at night and after you know, 7 a.m., five minutes, and we had to go to a, a, a joint box with seven salespeople, which was even better, because it was who gets it. It was like, hey, whoever responds quicker, and you gotta yeah. get it, and there's no email, you call them. And it was the same thing even back then when it was really easy to get leads on the internet because nobody else did it. You'd get people you'd talk to. I had a guy in Washington, we're in Kentucky. A guy in the state of Washington bought a best bass boat from us, and I said, why did you come here? He said, you're the only dealer that replied. He said, I literally contacted the dealers in Washington. Yeah. No reply. Yeah. And he's like, I started to think, if they don't reply and I end up buying from them eventually, yeah. I'm going to get what I paid for. Yeah. And this guy's in Washington buying a, a freaking bass boat from yeah. Kentucky. And it was because we replied quickly. And he said, every time I talked to you guys, it was Johnny on the spot. It was a reply right away, and it wasn't always the right answer. Yeah. Uh, as far as what I wanted to hear, it was just it was the answer that was actually what needed to be told. Yeah. No, I, I think absolutely. And we've been growing our event business here, and one of the things we believe in is we got to be aggressive, and aggressive in the right demeanor and yeah. authenticity, authenticity as well. But um, yeah, we can't just sit and wait for people to come to us because yep. um, it's going to take a really long time for that to happen. And so we have to get out on the streets and knock on the doors and be creative and you know, bring the menus and bring, you know, cookies or biscuits or whatever it might be um, to help them remember Hearth and Hill by. But um, yeah, I think people just want urgent, authentic and friendly and just someone that they can have a good rapport with and trust and 
be able to, at the end of the day, have an event or get food or whatever it might be and, and be able to have someone that can get the job done. Yeah. So now switching gears, you caught my attention uh, with the marketing on the tables about the, uh, the high school that you worked with. And it's got my attention because we deal with a lot of businesses and they're always looking for advice on, on marketing, on you know, how to do social media better. And I tell this example all the time, I'm like guys, my number one picture I use to market me for my company was taken by my daughter when she was 14 on her cell phone on Snapchat. <laughs> Not by a professional photographer, yeah. by her on Snapchat. And I'm yeah. like, oh, this is awesome and I use it. So talk about this program because I think this is something that a lot of restaurants could probably do in their neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean, I, I think first of all, finding the right employee is getting tougher today than it ever has been. Um, and so I think something easy that's right in our backyard are our local high schools. Um, where there's plenty of students, or what I like to say employees, that yeah. are right there. And there's programs in those schools. I mean, I, here at Park City High School, I mean, when I went to high school, it was just your simple classes. Yeah. You know, it was... Math, history. Yeah, exactly. And now they have, I mean, nursing classes and cooking classes and, I mean, all these crazy things. And one of that they offer is called PC Caps um, that helps young uh, kids in the school learn about how to be a professional and how those in the real world uh, run a business. And so... I had three uh, ladies that were seniors and then two ladies that were juniors at the local Park City High School that I got to work with this past um, spring, summer, and then into the fall. And so our, um, we were to give them a project that they could work on. And so they each took a week in the in end of November into December to help drive our lunch business, um, which during the pandemic have, has yeah. obviously taken a hit because of so many people working from home. Yep. And you know we have local businesses like Backcountry and School Candy that a lot of them are not working in the office right now. So how can we drive that lunch business? And they did a really good job. Um, and uh, they came up with things like the, the flyer that you have in front of you to help drive the business. Um, they had different themes to the week that they had. Um, but the two juniors really did an amazing job. It impressed me and it impressed me so much that we have, are now gonna bring them on to help us run our social media, um, Facebook, Instagram. Um, and then possibly, you know, open up some other areas as well. And so it's been awesome to connect with them because I never would have, you know, had that. Uh, I would never have known about their skill set if we didn't have this program in place. And so I think it's, it's really great. Um, and we have other great high schoolers that work here. The, the student body president of Park City High School is one of our hosts. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's fun to be a part of their lives at such a, a young, early age. Somebody, one of the restaurants a couple weeks ago in the podcast said, there's this negative perception about the younger generation. Yeah. They don't work as hard, yeah. budget. He's like, Matt, my daughter is in a band and the band director gets 150 kids to do exactly what he wants in these competitions. And it's not, it's, I don't know if you've ever been to a band competition, but these, no. it's crazy to watch these bands, how they move. And he's like, if, if that band director can get 100 plus kids, and he said on top of that, 25% of his team turns over every year because they graduate. Yeah. An eighth grader's coming, he's like, so if he can do that, and you're not able to at your restaurant, that means you're leading them wrong. Yeah. No, it's, it's absolutely true. And, you know, our m motto here is, is all about the associates. And because they're the ones that, like in any restaurant, any business, are the face. They're out there. They, they go through the experiences with the guests, the clients, more than most times the owner, the chef, the others. And so it's so important to have an open dialogue with them and hear what is going really well. Um, I learned at an early age in my career that feedback is a gift. And yes, it's not fun to hear at times, but it's so necessary to improve. Um, and we tell that to our team, you know, their feedback about how they enjoy working here is necessary to our success, as well as the feedback about how the menu is and are there items that we should take off or items that we should add or what's the feedback you're hearing from the guests. Um, and so we really take a lot of pride in taking care of our associates here at Hearth and Hill. Uh, we're probably one of the only restaurants uh, standalone restaurants in the state that offer full health insurance to our full-time employees. We offer a 401k program to any employee that's been here longer than a year and we match um, parts of it up to 6%. Um, during Thanksgiving, we gave a turkey to any associate that wanted one. We did a flu shot in the fall because of obviously everything going on. Um, anybody that wanted a flu shot, we took care of it for them. Associate of the month, different associate parties went safe and they're able to, obviously now with the pandemic going on. Um, but yeah, and then during the early parts of the pandemic, we did a grocery bag where Every associate could come by, by and, and get a grocery bag from us that was filled with different food items that they could take home. Um, and so, I, and also during the pandemic, one of the things was just that meant so much to them was keeping in contact. Yeah. You know, not just saying, eh, we'll let you know when we're able to reopen or able to do this, was every week we would call every single associate 
and just check in and see how they're doing. Because I think a lot of people don't realize, but I was on a James Beard call a few weeks ago about the mental challenges that so many restaurant employees are going through right now and the suicide rates and, and everything else that are so sad. Uh, I mean, I had an associate just last week that called me and said I was thinking about suicide. And it's, it's a call that just like, you know, takes your breath away. Um, but there are so many emotional challenges that everybody is going through. And I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned during the pandemic is every individual is so different, but needs to be given the attention uh, and the love and the care um, that takes a lot of time. But at the end of the day, uh, they, they appreciate it and it helps keep them here. And obviously the less turnover you have, the less money you have to spend on training yep. um, and everything else that comes with the constant turnover employees. And so it's just the little things I've learned throughout my career is just when you see one of your servers, bartenders, dishwashers, line cooks, just a simple question of how are you? And not just walking away as you ask the question, but staying there and listening and then responding with another question. And it's just a two minute conversation that to them has such a big impact. Um, it means so much to them. And I think sometimes restaurant owners, managers forget about that and think, oh, they're not going to care if I ask them you know, how they are, but it could save someone's life. It could really, you know, cause you to listen and be like, wow, I should, you know, do something. And it's caused us to, you know, help people out and write them checks for things or to help give them days off so that they can go do whatever they need to do to help give them, you know, at ease or, you know, their basement just flooded and they're freaking out and whatever it might be. And so, yeah, I think it's just listening and connecting is makes a big impact. And I think the key there is not only listening and you mentioned this is actually caring because yeah. I always tell people like, a sales capacity don't call me and say hey how you doing you don't really care how they're yeah. doing get yeah. to the point yeah. but if you're the boss and you're talking to your employee hey i don't you know i like the specific stuff yeah you know, like i recently and this isn't to pat me on the back but just as an example because i was brought up the same way uh one of our employees a couple months ago got a new place and i, I don't know what brought, brought me asked a question but i said something about what's your son's favorite cartoon to watch on saturday mornings in the new apartment and he's like well we don't have a tv yet and i'm like why not and he's like well, i don't really know and i went out and got him a tv I went and got, we got a gift card. We got him a gift card and dropped it up. Said, "Hey, this is your housewarming gift." But also, I think you're an amazing father, an amazing employee. I want to tell you, thank you. Yeah. And he was blown away by it and got a TV. And the next week, said, "Hey, we watched this." And so I yeah. think having conversations, like you said, that mean a little more than just, "Hey, how you doing? How was your day yesterday?" Hundred percent. I mean, we have an employee similar story that early on was out at a concert in downtown Salt Lake, um, had her car broken into, all of her makeup, which you know, said was worth a few hundred dollars was taken out of the car. And so I just went that night, walked over to the local grocery store, got a, I think, hundred dollar gift card to Sephora, gave it to her and she's still with us to this day. And I'd like to think that that gesture a year and a half ago yep. is part of the reason that she's still with us because listened, took action with it and followed through and gave her something that I think meant a lot in the moment. And you mentioned earlier too, about providing a deeper experience and a better for your customers. When your team cares, when your team sees that you care and they see that you pay attention yeah, uh, and then they care more, it comes across in how your customers are treated. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, starting at the top with our management team, um, we're a lucky restaurant. I know it's not everybody, but we have found a way to be able to keep all of our salaried managers fully paid throughout the pandemic, wow. um, which we're in a lucky situation to do that. And I know not everybody is. Um, and so I think that that has helped provide them the confidence to be like, okay, I'm lucky to have a job and I'm going to work really hard yeah. for Hearth and Hill to be as successful as we possibly can be during the pandemic. And um, I think it gives them the freedom to have a little bit less stress and anxiety and it allows them to then have the freedom to be creative in their thoughts and, and really focus 100% here at the restaurant. Um, and I think just to know that they, you have their back, I think really goes a long way more than I think a lot of people think. Yeah. Now to switch, switch gears a little, Yeah. your, your restaurant's beautiful. It's put together amazing. Thank you. And you're welcome. And I, I see businesses that'll, that'll do that, but then they'll crush it with a QR code, <laughs> packaging tape yeah. from UPS yep. to the table. Yep. And one of the first thing I noticed when I walked in, maybe it's because I'm the marketing guy, Yeah. but I saw this, and this is one of the best you know, presentations of a QR code I've seen. Why didn't you and what, what's, the, what's in your mind that you didn't take the easy route, photocopy some QR codes on the back and tape them to the table, but you went the extra, made an expense during a tough yeah. time, but for this presentation. Yeah, I mean, so to be honest, we had something that looked kind of like this at the beginning. And then um, I was a gentleman that's helped us design our menus over time. 
um, put me in contact and, and actually one of the montage properties okay. um, had this and said, wow, look at this. And I said, well, how can I get that? Um, these are actually made out of Los Cabos, Mexico. And funny enough, to your point, um, after we had them up, no joke, I think four or five local restaurants here in Park City <laughs> either texted me, called me, emailed me and said, hey, how can I get one of those same QR codes? And I was just in a restaurant uh, a few weeks ago and I was like, oh, look it, there it is. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, get royalties. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So no, we're Hector down in Los Cabos uh, is grateful for him. And I think it's just the little things in the presentation that can go a really long way with the guest. And, and our goal, like I told you at the beginning is to grow and have multiple hearts and hills and other concepts as well. And so we want to act the part and we want to act like a big boy restaurant and big girl restaurant and, and uh, a place that people can come in. And I think one of the, I've told my team this, one of the great forms of, um, I think compliments that we've gotten since day one is people will say, how many, you know, where are your other locations yeah. oh, or are you part of a chain? And I think that's a great compliment because it shows that we have already grown um, to adapt to being one of those bigger restaurants, yeah. if you will, um, which is certainly something that we're growing for. And so I think little things like a professional QR code go a long way. Yeah, when I, when I researched you guys, my first perception was this was a franchise of some sort because it was two put together to be put together by one, two person operation locally. But then when I saw your background and your father's, I'm like, okay, it makes sense. These guys just didn't wake up yesterday and say, hey, I'm gonna be in the restaurant business. Yeah, no, I mean, we're, we're really, really grateful and lucky to have the team that we do. You know, starting at the top with our chef who's been with us since day one, Jordan Harvey, our general manager, Corey Durfee, who's been with us for a year and a half, started as an AGM, got promoted to GM. Um, and it's something that we're really working on as we wanna grow is setting up the associates to be successful. And so in, in uh, allowing them to take classes outside of the restaurant, uh, we're, we're cooking classes, management classes, social media classes that will help their career growth um, and really putting them in opportunities that will push them to take the next step. Because yeah. um, our goal, you know, I told our AGM that we just hired a few months ago, I said, your goal should be to be the next GM of this restaurant and to push yourself to learn everything you possibly can and knock down every door and ask every question so that when that opportunity presents itself, you're ready to go yep. and we can you know throw you right in and you're ready to run with it and we don't have to spend months training you um, to be able to be a GM so yeah I think that the team that we have here has really had fun during the pandemic and we viewed it more so as an opportunity to really connect with our community and um, we've done nonprofit matching nights where we've given away over five thousand um, dollars where we'll partner with the nonprofit and give them 15 20 25 percent of our sales for that evening um, we've given away family meals to those in need in the community as well as partner with nonprofits and giving away family meals in other places, donated gift certificates to nonprofits that I know have been having a hard time of trying to fundraise um, because obviously they can't have in-person events and so they're trying to get creative in the ways that they can raise money to keep their nonprofit alive. Um, and we're lucky here in Park City to have over 140 nonprofits, which a lot of people wow. wouldn't expect for, you know, kind of a ritzy mountain town, if you will. but. Um, yeah, we're really lucky to have the community support that we do have here. Um, and I think that that goes a long way with the community to want to support your business as well. If they know that you're investing in their kids and in the schools and the local nonprofits, then they're going to want to invest their money with you. Um, and, and we've had the mindset that during the pandemic, um, especially, you know, here in Park City and in other places that people are going to ch choose very wisely where they spend their hard earned money. Um, and it's not going to come as easy as it did before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people that are, are struggling, and so we want to do our part to help however we possibly can. Restaurant owners, did you know Matt has free online marketing courses that teach you how to successfully market your restaurant? Email support at mattplapp.com to get access to the courses and a free social media content calendar. I love it. Well, the last question. Yeah. I'll let you go on because you've got a great operation to run here. I always ask at the end of it, what do you do to put yourself in airplane mode? Because as entrepreneurs, it's easy to be turned on all day, yeah. thinking, working, doing something. Uh, what do you do to turn it off, step away from the restaurant and, and be you? Yeah, you know, funny enough, the gentleman, Steve, that brought me to, to Zoom, Robert Redford's restaurant, um, and he's now, I've hired him here. So kind of a, a 360 um, that I, he was my boss and now I'm, I'm technically his boss. He's helping us grow and develop the restaurant. But, Early on at Zoom, he, I would freak out or stress out over situations or there'd be nights where I'd tell my wife, oh yeah, I'll be home at 5.30 and next thing you know, it's <laughs> seven o'clock and there's 30 tickets in the window. I'm like, there's no way I'm leaving right now. Um, and she you know, would be like, you told me you were gonna be home. And, and he finally said, he's like, Brooks, 
whether you're here or not, A, you gotta trust your team, and B, things are gonna happen. And you can deal with them the next day if it means you gotta call a guest and apologize or give them a gift card or whatever it might mean to resolve the situation, then you'll do that. But for your own sanity, you gotta trust your team and you gotta be able to walk away and know that things are gonna be okay. And so here, I'm a big sports guy. And so for me, uh, I love watching the games. I'm a big Clippers fan. Um, and then I have a 17 month old son at home. Congrats. And so uh, he has brought, I'm sure just like many out there, a lot of levity during this situation. And something on those crazy days here, um, something that I can just distract myself with and, and play around with on the floor or take him for a walk or go to the zoo or whatever it might be to, to really just step away. Because I think to maintain healthiness in a restaurant, as much as some of us are just addicted to this grind, um, that you do need a break. And for the health of the rest of the team that you manage, because um, if you're in their face 365, they may not want to be a part of that anymore because you're just constantly just nitpicking them. And, and so if you can step away and give them the break, give yourself a break, I think it's healthy for everybody. And it's taken me a while to learn that, but I think over time it helps your team grow in a way, and, and it gives people opportunities because if you don't step away and let them be the one that makes the decisions and you know take the risks and everything else, then they're never going to be able to learn. And then when you do want to grow, you're not going to have the, the right people in the place to be able to grow. Yep. So, yeah. Well, perfect. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for stopping by. We hope you enjoy your time here in Park City. We will. And that's it for this episode of MPTV. If you take anything from this conversation, it's that the people you've got in your operation need to know you've got their back, need to be the right people, and need to be the right ones to be on the bus or your limo. Yes. We'll yes. see you next episode.